So way back in June, I had big plans to have a whole month of themed movie reviews. My big brain thought, what are the most common occurrences in generic rom-coms? And came up with the revolutionary answer, weddings. I then hand-selected four films to watch, script, and review. And to give myself credit, I did watch all four films and even completed two reviews. But then life got crazy. Skipping forward, and here I am, smushing the last two films' reviews together. These two particular movies actually have a very similar plot. The only big difference is being that they're gender swapped and one is actually good. <coughs> Shall we to continue? These two I actually remember seeing before when I was going through like a phase during puberty, but I couldn't seem to remember the ending to either one. I'm sure I finished both, but my brain decided the whole ass ending of two films wasn't important enough to store away for future reference. Really, I, I can't blame it. Let me introduce you to my victims, my best friend's wedding and maid of honor. Let's start with the older and better of the two. My Best Friend's Wedding was released June 20th, 1997. It's currently only available in streaming services for like an additional fee. It's kind of worth it though. However, I had other means of watching it. Moving on. Directed by PJ Hogan, who also directed the 2003 Peter Pan, which I should definitely watch again, and Confessions of a Shopaholic and starring Julia Roberts from Pretty Woman and Runaway Bride, Cameron Diaz from What Happens in Vegas, Shrek, and Charlie's Angels, this one, and Dermot Maroney from Must Love Dogs and The Memory Keeper's Daughter. The synopsis goes as follows. Childhood friends Julianne Potter and Michael O'Neill had a deal if they were still single by the age 28. Now, four days before her 28th birthday, O'Neill announces that he's marrying a gorgeous 20-year-old named Kimberly. Suddenly realizing that she's actually in love with him, Julianne vows to stop the wedding at all costs. However, when she is appointed maid of honor, things get even more complex. My Best Friend's Wedding was a decently received film. It's currently certified fresh on Rotten Tomatoes. Why don't we see if it deserves it, hmm? Once we get past this really out of place music video intro, show him that you care just for him. We meet our main character, Julianne Potter, or Jules, played by Julia Roberts. I'm writing it up as inventive and confident. Jules here is a renowned food critic, and this handsome, posh fellow is George, her editor and dear friend. While checking her voicemail via a very 90s uh, cell phone, Jules finds out that her ex-lover and best friend, Michael, has something urgent he needs to talk to her about. I can't wait to talk to you. I'm in Chicago at the Drake Hotel. I guess I'm, uh... Okay, well, call me. Four in the morning. Whatever. We gotta talk. Bye. George, ever the gossip, desires details, and Jules provides. It turns out, after their month-long relationship fizzled out, she and Michael became best friends. And one crazy night, they made a pact that if they both weren't married by 28, they'd marry each other. And what do you know? Jules' 20th birthday is just around the corner, so... Georgie Boy makes the bold and misguided assumption that that's why Michael is calling so suddenly. Cheers. Courage. Oh, George. You really started this all. Well, later, while talking to the man himself and bringing up their bargain, Michael announces that he's met someone and is getting married in four days. Michael, what? Hello? Michael, it's, it's Wednesday night. How can you possibly be getting married on Sunday? So, definitely not the proposal she was expecting. She agrees to fly out from New York to Chicago for his spontaneous wedding with the secret diabolical plan of sabotaging the whole thing and winning Michael's affection. I'm a busy girl. I've got exactly four days to break up a wedding, steal the bride's fella, and I haven't one clue how to do it. At the airport, we get to meet the man himself, played by Dormant Maroney, 
and we finally meet the 20 year old that could get him to settle, Kimmy, played by Cameron Diaz. I hope she brought that luggage cart for Jules and not just to hold her purse because come on though, it's real. that looks ridiculous. Instantly Jules knows competition is gonna be rough because besides being a hectic and dangerous driver, Kimmy is perfect. She's a college junior studying architecture. Her father owns some baseball team. She's basically the sweetest human being. Because her best friend broke her pelvis and where else would we get such dramatic tension? Kimmy asks Jules to be her maid of honor. At first she's apprehensive, but then takes it as the perfect opportunity to enact her plans. And this is where I'm going to speed things along, like skip like 40 minutes. Turns out a lot of people expected Michael to marry Jules, including his own father. And Kimmy! There is a bit of a tense situation in the elevator where Kimmy breaks it down while Jules is having a panic attack. She's claustrophobic. You win. I've missed a step. He's got you on a pedestal. And me in his arms. Gotta hand it to the girl. She's got balls. Anyway, Jules' tactics to destroy the happily ever after includes embarrassing Kimmy via karaoke after she confesses that she's an atrocious singer. Oh, hey. Doesn't exactly work though, because Michael finds her um, singing endearing. Later, after calling in for backup, Jules announces to Michael that she too is engaged to George. <laughs> well, that's Jules. <laughs> yeah. hey, congratulations. congratulations. What? I, I told him, puppy. I mean, if we're engaged, we really shouldn't be ashamed of it. <laughs> George isn't exactly thrilled at this for many reasons, but one of them being that she took his sound advice, stomped on it, set it on fire, and threw it out the window. He goes along with it, not really to help, but to make her suffer just a little. The moment I wake up, <laughs> before I put on my makeup, I run for the bus, dear. While riding, I think of us, dear. I say a little prep for you. Cue another out of place musical break, but really. What else are we here for? I swear, this isn't supposed to be a musical like my last review. Now Jules uses her relationship with Michael and Kimmy to get some dirt on the couple. After the nuptials, Kimmy is going to be dropping out of college to follow Michael around the country since he's a traveling sports reporter. She isn't super thrilled to do this, neither is her father but she wants to be supportive. Kimmy mentions to Jules that her father would be more than happy to offer Michael a permanent and stationary job, but she's not sure that Michael would take it. Jules hypes Kimmy up though to bring it up to Michael because she shouldn't have to sacrifice so much for his bachelor-like lifestyle. It would have been some sound advice, if I'm being honest, if Jules wasn't using it to destroy the relationship. Our lovers quarrel but to Jules' dismay, it doesn't last. They make up and go on their merry way, which means Jules has to turn up the heat. She meets Kimmy's dad at his office under the guise of driving him somewhere as a favor, I think, and asks to use his phone while he finishes up some business stuff. Unsupervised, Jules logs into his email and sends a message to Michael's boss as Kimmy's dad, asking him to fire Michael so he'll not take his daughter away from him. After some thought, Jules decides against sending the email, but doesn't delete it? Unfortunately for her, Mr. Kimmy tells the secretary to send out some unsent emails for him, including the one Jules didn't fucking delete. Jewelry boo. I'm filming. He enjoyed it. You sweet. Why would she leave such evidence around? Who knows? Well, it got sent, and Michael's boss contacted him, not to fire him, but to let him know what he's marrying into. I can't believe I'm doing this to you on the night before your wedding, but I think you need and deserve to know what you're marrying into. I received the following email this afternoon. Eric, I need a favor. My daughter's every... 
So we get more fighting between the couple. As fitting punishment, Jules gets to play messenger between the two and accidentally patches things up for them. It's a good thing too because the wedding is like that day or something, so it really would suck if something were to happen. So Jules finally grows a backbone and at the advice of George, George tells Michael that she's loved him this whole time and just has like the worst commitment issues. She asks him to choose her and then kisses him on his wedding day. <laughs> and you know how it is. Kimmy sees, Michael runs after Kimmy and Jules runs after Michael. She also steals this bakery's truck. Second time we've seen Julia Roberts drive away in a delivery truck. While on the chase, Jules calls George. She spills all that happened and he stops her by asking if Michael even kissed her back. Who's chasing you? Nobody. Get it? There's your answer, Kimmy. No! Yes, Jules, you are not the one. And I guess that's all she needs to get it through her head that maybe this man that she hasn't been seeing romantically for like eight years isn't in love with her anymore. Jules eventually finds Michael at the train station because that's where he ended up proposing to Kimmy all those weeks ago. This is where she confesses it all. I have a confession to make. Another confession. Not that she's loved him this whole time, but that she's been trying to ruin the wedding since he told her about it. He gets angry, rightfully so, but she puts on her big girl pants and sends him back to get ready while she goes looking for Kim, finally acting like a maid of honor. Turns out, Kimmy is at the baseball stadium her daddy owns because it's like her safe space. Now we get to see Kimmy just lay into Jules like she should, and Jules takes it because really can't and shouldn't fight back. You kissed him at my parents' house oh. on my wedding day! <laughs> Tramp. Now, I love this man, and there is no way that I'm going to give him up to some two-faced, big-haired food critic. After that's all done and over with, they're off to the wedding. The whole thing looks fantastic for being planned in like two weeks or something like that. Jules looks gorgeous, but the real star is Kimmy as it should be. At the reception, Jules gives a lovely speech and gifts the couple with a song. This is on loan until you two find your song. Michael had mentioned that he and Kimmy didn't have a couple song and Jules gives them what used to be hers and Michael's. After the newly married couple leaves to live their new married life, Jules is left to wander around the reception alone. And then the phone rings, and we hear George's sultry voice yet again. Here he, once again, traveled from New York to Chicago last minute to keep her company and end. Some quick thoughts before we get into the next film. I really liked My Best Friend's Wedding. It isn't perfect, but it makes sense to a degree. Jules doesn't get the man, but she does mature. After an annoying four days of acting like a toddler and not wanting to share her toys, she lets Michael go while admitting she loved him and realizing why she never mentioned it before. She was always just trying to protect herself and keeping him close, but also at an arm's distance was comforting to her. In the end, she let him find his own happiness and opened herself up to hopefully find her own in the future. Now let's turn our attention to the gender swapped edition and see how it compares. <laughs> Maid of Honor was released May 2nd, 2008, 11 years after my best friend's wedding. And it was received less than favorably. Let's just say it wasn't certified fresh. It's currently on Netflix and some other streaming services, but for an additional fee. Directed by Paul Weiland, who also directed the television show Mr. Bean, and starring Patrick Dempsey from Enchanted and Grey's Anatomy, and Michelle Monaghan from the 2005 Constantine and the last couple Mission Impossible movies. Now for the synopsis. Always shy of commitment, Tom lives as a serial dater. Hannah, his best friend, 
has wanted to marry and now has found Mr. Wright. Just as Tom realizes he really loves Hannah. When she asks him to be in her bridal party, Tom seizes the opportunity to prevent the nuptials and will her himself. You see the similarities? Let's dive into the dumpster then. So let's start off with the worst scene. At a Halloween party at Cornell University in 1998. I wonder if this whole scene is referencing something in particular. That dress needs dry cleaning. Here you go. Thank you kindly. Maybe something that is not exactly appropriate nowadays. Would you have ever guessed that Bill here is actually our main male protagonist and popular playboy, Tom? Well, let's see how this plays out. He's obviously going to meet our female lead, and I'm sure that can't be highly inappropriate as well, right? That would that would be ridiculous. Oh, yes, Tom met his future best friend and love interest by assaulting her in her own bed in her own dorm. He's lucky she only had perfume handy. I'll tell you that. This is Tom, played by Patrick Dempsey. And to be kind of fair, he didn't intend on groping Hannah here, played by Michelle Monaghan. Tom had a date with Hannah's roommate, and Hannah was expected to be out studying because she's a nerd. Anyway, the two properly introduce themselves after Tom washes the chemical out of his eye. They bond, blah, blah, blah. Ugh. Fast forward to modern day New York, our lovely Tom here wakes up in the arms of a random woman. When asked to have breakfast or something, he quickly declines. <laughs> See, Tom. Tom here. has got some stupid rules to keep the ladies from getting attached. I don't remember all the rules and I really couldn't care less what they are. They're not important. And it doesn't matter anyway because Tom has other places to be. Now, next is my favorite part. While picking up some coffee at, I think, a Starbucks or something, we find out how this man never has to work. Oh, oh here. Let me put a coffee collar on that for oh, you. Oh, thank you. I hear the guy that invented that gets a dime for each one used. You're kidding. I am not. Besides being the son of a already wealthy man, Tom patented those little cup sleeves that keep you from burning your hand. There was even a scene in his and Hannah's like, I guess you'd call it a meat cute that referenced his genius idea. Why did the movie have to establish how Tom made his money? The world may never know. So where is New York's favorite bachelor headed on an early Saturday morning? To have a very wholesome date with Hannah that is. And this is a regular thing, like every week. They meet up, share some desserts at a very popular bakery, and browse the local antique market. And it's here Tom tries to convince Hannah to be his plus one at his father's latest wedding. You see, here's where we get a little insight on why Tom's the way he is. No, you don't act on that pretty soon. You know what I'm gonna do? No. I'm gonna make her my number six. Ah, oh. <laughs> Seven, this is number six. Like father, like son, I guess. Skipping ahead to said wedding, we're introduced to the man of the hour while he and his lawyer are discussing the prenup with the bride-to-be and her attorney. After some uncomfortable negotiation. I still agree to three with a bi-monthly BJ. Oh, this is disturbing. Four and make it weekly. Wait, wait. It's time to celebrate wife number six or seven, maybe five, whatever. Gets drunk off her ass and Tom is left to hide from a character that never comes back. There's no reason for this stalker to be around except to have Hannah pretend to be his girlfriend and boy, does she just play it off well. Oh. I'm a bit of an emotional retard. Yeah. What? We're, we're going, we're going to move on. We're going to move on. Hannah sets off on a business trip for like a month in Scotland, which gives Tom plenty of time to realize what she means to him. No other woman, as much as he tries, can fill the Hannah-shaped void in his life. It's only been like four weeks, but 
whatever. I guess Scotland has no cell reception because they can't even talk to one another. Finally, the day of Hannah's return comes and Tom, with the help of some of his friends, decides to confess his love and make a move towards a serious relationship. Dun, dun, dun. Looks like Hannah got herself a souvenir from Scotland. Well, this is Colin. Much like Kimmy from the last film, Colin is fucking perfect. And after knowing each other for like a week, he's proposed to Hannah. So not only is Hannah now seeing someone, she's getting married in a matter of weeks. This is like a thing people do in real life. Back to the action. Hannah has made the bold and ever so quirky decision to have Tom as her maid of honor. Will you be my maid of honor? <laughs> Your maid of honor. Plus the plan to ruin the wedding and take her for himself is struck. Tom's goal here is to be like the best maid of honor to show Hannah how much he's matured and whatever. Hannah's cousin isn't exactly happy about the decision because she's known Hannah way longer and she's like a professional mo. What is a mo? M-O-H. Oh, maid of honor. So she thinks she should have been picked. Oh, and she's one of Tom's lovers. Before we move on, there's this one character that is Hannah's friend from summer camp, I think, and another one of the bridesmaids. I really like her. She's really cute. She's really precious. You know, she's a wholesome character. But her whole personality in this film is that she's fat and trying to lose weight before the wedding. I'm talking like two, three whole dress sizes in the matter of two weeks. Eight. <clears throat> I'm sorry. You know, Hillary, uh, do you think that maybe you just be more comfortable and like a 12? This is so unhealthy and really unfair to this character. It's literally her whole deal, the entire movie, and it ends with her ripping her dress at the wedding. The only good thing that comes out of it is that she gets herself a hunky Scotsman too. But that's not... It's not a consolation prize. It's not a reward. Now shall we move on? The quick version is that Tom does impress Hannah like every now and again by doing an insane amount of research, but he totally blows it by inviting an erotic toy sales lady to Hannah's bridal shower with her family. It's very important to reset our third eye, right? And connect to the primal <laughs> inside of ourselves <laughs> before I present the pleasure aids. Pleasure aids? Now, you wanna try those out, princess? Wh where do these go? Giving him some credit. He didn't know that that's what she was. Hannah's cousin gave him the business card and said she was a fortune teller, but the man should have done some more research before booking her. Is that not common sense? Anyway, we're off to Scotland. Turns out Colin is not only the perfect man, he's also related to royalty. No, is this the summer house? The McMurrays have homes for each season. This summer home is the smallest. Oh. Perfect walking stereotype. While Hannah's camp friend's personality is fat, Colin is Scottish. And because Hannah's only known him for like maybe a month, this is all a surprise for her. Do you know he's been playing the bagpipes ever since he was three years old, practices every night. Every night? Oh, never misses. Plus his family is a little overbearing. Awful. Excuse me? Uh, it's a name for the children. We get some more Scottish traditions like this games competition where Tom makes a fool of himself, and this weird one where the bride kisses any bloke that gives some coins. I don't know if this is like a real tradition, and I'm not knocking it if it is. It just doesn't sound sanitary to me. It's this very tradition that gets Tom a chance to really lay one on Hannah though. Filled with confused emotion, Hannah heads to Tom's room later that night only to find her half-naked cousin with him. Oh no, an easily explainable misunderstanding that 
will result in the third act conflict. Who could have seen it coming? Quickly now, we're almost there. Tom leaves, changes his mind, heads to the venue where he quite literally crashes through the doors. Tom confesses his love for Hannah, Hannah does the same, they kiss, and Colin socks Tom in the face. What'd she say? She said I should dick you. Oh yeah, that makes sense. Rightfully so. And boom, flash forward to Tom and Hannah's wedding. It's a happily ever after for all, including Tom's dad who hits on uh, Hannah's cousin. Number six, seven. Boy. That was a doozy. I did not enjoy this movie as much as I remember I did as a tween. The movie is full of stereotypes. Obviously I talked about Hannah's bridesmaid and Colin, and then there's the fact that Colin's family assumes that Tom is gay because he's in the bridal party, and it's just like this kind of like offended vibe going on. Plus we had the incident. Some may say that it's a uh, an older movie, so, you know, give it a pass. It was only 2008. It was only 15 years ago, and I know that sounds like a long time ago, but like, really, they should have known better. When comparing the two films, I definitely say I prefer My Best Friend's Wedding to Maid of Honor. They both have scarily similar plots, but where MBFW shows actual growth from the main character, MOH fails miserably. I don't actually believe Tom grows as a person, but also Hannah was immature as well. And let's be real, they're both awful and selfish people. My final ratings are my best friend's wedding, 8 out of 10. And maid of honor, 4.5 out of 10. My only positive comparison is that both movies had great actors that played the characters well, even when some of the writing wasn't the greatest. That's all I can say now. I've been working on this project for too long, and I really don't want to look at it anymore. Please let me know if you agree or disagree with my critiques, but please, all I ask is that you're kind, because I'm really sensitive, okay guys? Peace.